everyone. I'm Shucharita, policy analyst and deputy head, uh, Calcutta Resource Center of Cuts International, a public policy think tank. On behalf of Cuts and uh, Frederick Ebert Stiftung, FES India, today it is my pleasure to welcome all of you to the first podcast of the series that we have uh, conceptualized as a part of our ongoing uh, project supported by FES India on evolution, aligning the just energy transition agenda in the electric mobility ecosystem with the G20 framework. Today's uh, discussion will be on the theme, gender inclusivity in the mobility sector. Before getting into the hardcore discussion, let me also introduce today's panel. We have with us Mr. Pawan Mulukutla, Director, Integrated Transport, Electric Mobility and Hydrogen, WRI India. We have two representatives from Urban Catalyst, we have Ms. Sonal Shah, who's the founder, and we also have Ms. Manisha Sharma, who's the senior project associate, Integrated Urban Transport. The session is going to be moderated by Ms. Manvi Kulshreshta. She is the program advisor, Social Economic Transformation from AFES India. I'm sure this is going to be a very enriching session for all of us with diverse insights being shared by the panel. Without any further ado, may I request Manvi to kindly take over. Thank you, Sucharita, and a very warm welcome to the experts today. Uh, I'm glad that we are kicking off this podcast series with one of my uh, most favorite topics, uh, uh, gender in the mobility sector. I think uh, the topic should get more precedence, as in the issue itself should get more precedence when we are talking about the sector. Uh, so very glad that all of you could make it uh, to today's podcast and we are looking forward to all the conversations here and hoping to, uh, you know, move ahead uh, with the discussion and try to influence the sector in a social justice manner. Um, just to give our audiences a brief introduction, I'm, um, we are here right now talking about just energy transition or, uh, you know, just say, how the specifically for the mobility sector, so how the mobility sector is transitioning from uh, fossil fuels to better forms of fuels, um, which includes uh, uh, you know CNG or electric mobility, hydrogen and ethanol. Uh, but for today's podcast, we will concentrate more on the e-mobility sector, the electric mobility sector. Um, and we know that for any sector to transform in you know in the real sense. Uh, uh, whether it's uh, use of new technology or uh, you know adoption of uh, new kinds of uh, innovation, uh, any apart from these, uh, the other important factors, especially for say uh, an organization like FES or Kurtz or for our experts here as well, is that the transformation should happen in social, ecological, and economic uh, fields as well. So when we are talking about transition into greener ways, we are also talking about it being more inclusive, it being more equitable uh, and smart, of course. So for our conversation today, we'll try to base our questions and responses on the aspects of climate justice, social justice, and gender justice in the uh, e-mobility sector. Uh, now, of course, we all know that you know gender inclusivity in the mobility sector or in the e-mobility sector remains a challenge primarily because you know India is still a patriarchal society so there are uh, restrictions of how you know women are expected to behave conduct themselves uh, uh, and obviously that has uh, bearing on their mobility uh, as well uh, and then there are varying degrees of you know social economic or political empowerment um, so Today, when we look at gender inclusivity in the mobility sector, we will look at it from two perspectives or two lenses. Uh, one is going to be uh, women as users of e-mobility. Uh, so whether they are private users or uh, in their own businesses. And secondly, we'll talk about women making uh, EVs or you know part of the entire EV manufacturing sector. Uh, but before we dive into the specifics of uh, EVs, uh, let's some let's establish some basic understanding here. And I would uh, like to ask Manisha the first question: um, What do we understand by gender-responsive mobility? So, in very brief, if you could, you know, 
explain to us what it entails. Thank you, Mandi. Uh, so uh, when we talk about gender responsive mobility, what we refer to is the transportation system that in accounts for needs and preferences of all genders, men, women, trans men, trans women, and all other uh, genders. And we all, when we talk about specifically women, we also want to include the intersectional aspects as well. So for example, women with disabilities, girls, and uh, women of old age. Now, uh, already international literature has established that men and women travel differently. For example, they have different trip lengths, different travel times, as well as the number of trips that they make. So while the international studies suggest that women travel more, uh, we have found through our projects that this is slightly different in Indian cities. So when we did uh, household surveys in three cities of Bihar in 2022, we found out that women travel lesser than uh, men. So their daily travel, they are traveling 37, per, they are making 37% fewer trips than men and they are using more sustainable modes of transportation including public transport, unintermittent public transport or they are walking. So uh, in these three cities, 60% of the total walk trips are done by women and while 20% of the total trips are by intermediate public transportation in that as well the majority share of 60% are taken by women only so here uh, these findings are specific specifically from the tier 2 cities where there is a limited data av available however we can think that if there can be similar results in the tier 1 cities as well when where women use more sustainable modes of transport now i want to highlight two three main things one is that the travel patterns differs within the women groups as well because uh, there are different women groups based on income, based on marital status or the, their work occupation. So in 2020, uh, we did a survey with 80, 80, uh, sorry, 800 resource for women in Delhi and 400 online surveys with women who have little higher income than the resource for women. And we found out that among all, the, they all are traveling, uh, major, majority of the trips were work trips. However, their peak travel time is different from the travel time of the buses, predominant mode of transport they are using. So we still wonder that why those peak travel is different and there is a reason why these pub bus-based public transport are currently not able to take care of their needs because they have different peak, uh, peak travel times. Then uh, also uh, because there is less frequency during off-peak hours. These women tend to take auto rickshaws and other forms of IPT, which are comparatively uh, expensive than the bus-based transport because in Delhi, they have free travel for women. The second part is uh, comes the safety of women. So when we talk about safety, we specifically focus on girls, women with disabilities, and trans men and women as well. So uh, we assisted GIZ to understand the perception of safety and their experiences in three cities of Kerala, which include Arnakulam, Kozikode, and Trivandrum, and we did more than 1,200 surveys. We found out that majority, like 74% of the girls, which age between 18 to 24, faced sexual harassment more than uh, older women, and also they seem to be more vocal about sharing those experiences. And uh, the sad part is that majority of them uh, restrict their travel after 7 p.m. because of the safety issues. Then uh, third part is when we talk about the whole concept of gender mobility, we, there is a very limited focus on trans people as well, like trans men, women, because they have different gender identities which are not normalized in our society yet. So uh, we did focus group discussions with trans men and women, and we found out that they fail our face lot of harassment from the commuters in terms of staring, la laughing at them when they're traveling. So uh, one of the trans men mentioned that they usually try to avoid talk in the public transport as well, because when they try to speak, they attract a lot of stares, which is a very common form of sexual harassment normal people are not aware of. So this makes them conscious and you know, because of that, they're not able to use public transport effectively and they kind of lose opportunity due to inaccessibility of public transport, jobs or educational opportunities as well. So to sum it up, that when whenever we talk about gender, we should include all the intersectional uh, groups as well. 
yes uh, thank you manisha so much for pointing that out yes of course uh, i mean it is very crucial to integrate all genders uh, and we i mean unfortunately there isn't much data available as well on um, you know how how well they are integrated or not integrated i mean from uh, here say we know uh, the condition so far but um, for today's podcast i think we'll limit it to women and uh, gender a uh, responsive mobility i think is in itself a podcast topic and like it deserves many many podcasts but i think for today uh, we'll concentrate on women here and then probably some other time we'll also take up uh, you know the trans issues in the mobility sector i think that will be a very good topic to explore as well um but uh, coming back to our agenda for the day um as i said we'll talk about first the women who are using evs um, privately or as part of their uh, businesses so just trying to find out some data over google or internet search and um, while we know that you know only uh, a million uh, a little more than a million ev vehicles are on road in uh, india right now which is roughly 2% i mean you're the expert so you can correct me roughly 2% of all the vehicles currently uh but uh, uh the percentage of women owning evs um, is i mean there's no data around it also percentage of women owning evs for their businesses whether it's two wheeler or three wheeler or four wheeler that data is also at least to me i couldn't find any such data um so if you are aware of uh, any numbers please do uh, mention it in the podcast um but considering the you know the socio economic conditions in the country i we can assume that it will be you know a very insignificant percentage uh, right now um so my next question would be to sonal here and um, um just to understand what are the key factors uh, which are contributing to gender gap in e mobility or uh, e vehicles ownership in india currently um thanks uh, for having me here manvi um and uh, to fes india and cuts international um so i think like you said uh, rightly that i think we might be over um uh, half a million of evs in the country but what we also need to acknowledge is at least about 1 and 1/2 million of lead acid battery powered e rickshaws um in india as well and uh, and of course we have seen an increase in um, electric buses too some of the work that we did around asset ownership of uh, electric vehicles and particularly e rickshaws um Uh, was that uh, we actually partnered with a membership based organization who was supporting resource poor women in the asset ownership of uh, e rickshaws they were trying to leverage the delhi electric vehicle policy in order to uh, obtain subsidies on uh, the purchase of the vehicles what we found um when we compared how men and women e rickshaw owner operators were using their vehicles um, was the following and I, i think this will also give you an idea of why we need uh, to consider gender as a key category when we are talking about ev asset ownerships and particularly commercial and public service vehicles so we found that uh, the women ev operators were actually operating on routes that were about 48% shorter than the male e rickshaw operators and this could be attributed to the fact that they may want to operate in areas that are closer to their home in order to manage their household and care work on average they were working about 7 hours a day compared to 10 hours um by working i mean uh, remunerative work because in the other 3 hours they were engaged in unpaid household um and care work right so what this does is that that when we don't have supportive uh, care infrastructure then this disproportionately affects a uh, women um operator and it's not it's not restricted to electric vehicles but it certainly has an impact when you're an owner Um, operator as well 
The third big piece that we observed is, you know, when we look at e-rickshaws, we know that they are modified, right? So that in addition to carrying four passengers behind, uh, you also have two seats on either side. I mean, you have one seat on either side of the driver. Now, unfortunately, women were not able to do this for safety concerns, right? And because sometimes if you had male passengers who would misbehave. So what this eventually resulted in women owner operators earning 25 to 30 percent lower than the male operators. Now, let's factor this because this when it's this when this has an impact when gender norms have an impact on the way you're going to operate an EV asset, then an EV policy needs to consider that in its financing mechanisms and in financial subsidies. The second piece I also want to talk about is driving as a profession, right? Because in this case, we had a membership based organization who supported the, the women in obtaining a driving license. Uh, so I think that when we talk about encouraging um, asset ownership, particularly of commercial and public service vehicles is we need to recognize a higher need for financial subsidies as well as care infrastructure and recognize institutional support as well in uh, going through the entire licensing process as well as going through the, um, the financing process as well. And I think this is where we want to talk about how women can also benefit you know, from, this, from this transition to uh, electric vehicles as, as asset owners do. Yes, surely you brought up two, three critical points. And I think, uh, as in, I understand that at least the Delhi government is trying to um, push for a little more progressive uh, policies here. So they have, uh, uh, for say, for bus drivers, uh, they have uh, done away with the restriction on the height of the bus driver so that more women can apply for the job. Or they have also done away with the uh, driving license fee of 15 thousand rupees or something like that uh, which shall enable more women to you know then they don't have to invest upfront in or yeah basically be able to get into the system more easily so i mean it, it, it is also some kind of incentive are you trying yeah. to say something yeah yeah i was just wanting to say that you know we've seen about two ten i think at least two national tenders on electric buses and both of them have some provisions right around employment of women in uh, either in buses or in depots etc by the private operator but i think more is required because targets by themselves don't work you know and mm -hmm. so we, i think in order for this to become uh, substantive and to be realized on the ground we need supportive measures in order to ensure that this can actually be realized starting from making it mandatory or ensuring that there are enabling infrastructure and policies as well exactly and while you all uh, you know mentioned uh, factors such as you know shorter trips or uh, support for care work and uh, better financial subsidies uh, that mostly on the asset ownership side uh, that you mentioned but in general say for re uh, women also to be users or you know uh, own them privately what do you think are you know the factors that uh, affect their purchasing decisions? You know, one of the most interesting things that I think might, uh, and we might also be seeing is, um, especially electric two wheelers, right? And we do have certain electric two wheelers in the market, which don't necessarily, con you know, uh, because, because they operate on less than 25 kilometers per hour, what it does is it reduce, I mean, it doesn't require a driving license anymore. And that itself can actually make a big difference because the licensing process itself sometimes can be a, a barrier. Um, when, you know, we had conducted a study um, for the World Bank on gender and electric mobility and where we were looking at um, women's employment in the EV value chain and the battery and charging infrastructure value chain, but also women as users. And when um, we presented to a group of experts, including uh, WRI, 
uh, some of the interesting anecdotal information that came out was that the charging of the vehicles at home may also mean that uh, households may feel more comfortable rather than you know women having to charge their vehicles um, I mean, not charge, go to either a petrol pump in order to refuel their vehicles, right? So this also creates some perception of uh, safety and security uh, for the household as well. So I think this is also an interesting perspective. Again, it's anecdotal. I don't necessarily have any quantifiable um, uh, data uh, related to this, but I should mention, and this particularly is something we're observing in, uh, we observe this in Patna uh, uh, as well, and also in Ghazibad, is that when an electric vehicle uh, loses its charge and stops, right? Because there, this can become more concerning for women passengers, right? Uh, because like you could be stranded in the middle of nowhere. So this is that the concern around charging infrastructure and ensuring that the vehicle is charged it poses a different kind of set of uh, uh, safety concerns uh, for for women yeah. users. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. And I think this is also one of the concerns for women uh, e-rickshaw drivers. That probably one of the reasons why they are making shorter trips as well because they don't want to be too far away from the charging station. But if you're stranded in a place where, uh, yeah, uh, yeah. So yeah, those concerns are also to be kept in mind. Um, but um, again, coming back to uh, some stereotypes that are still around in the in in our society, I would like to come back to Manisha and uh, just a quick understanding of uh, how do you think you know the marketing and uh, advertising, especially how e uh, two wheelers are advertised or how we see the you know the three wheeler industry is coming up. Uh, what role do you think uh, market and advertising has in perpetuating more gender, you know, stereotypes or whether they're able to break some of these uh, stereotypes? So uh, one of the things that we can look up the how these two whalers are advertised or these e-vehicles are advertised and all the advertisement, advertisements, mostly we see men making it more comforting and you know going out that okay this makes them free there are very limited advertisement that focus on women taking that role and the second aspect is if we could also include women working in the field of transportation on ground to show that you know there are opportunities that women can take up forward is also helpful to take this one Thank you. Thank you so much. So I think media also has a big role to play in the entire communication, how, you know, uh, through images or, you know, through actions, how the message is put across that also is very important. Uh, but now moving on to women in making of uh, e-vehicles, I would like to come to Pavan and first and foremost question. And I heard you at the WII Connect, Karo, and you mentioned that there are 6% uh, women workforce in the in the energy renewable energy sector or just in the e-mobility sector i actually wanted that clarification automotive manufacturing in automotive manufacturing so uh, uh, do we know how much is there in the e-mobility sector like out of the 6% what's the division no we don't have the exact numbers uh, manvi but i think that's where We'll need a lot of this information available, right? Like how many women are working. I think uh, non-availability of data is a big challenge. Um, and let's also not forget that we are talking also about both the um, women engaged as contractual and temporary basis also, right? So it's yeah. not just engaged formally, which we're talking about. Six per the six percent also includes the forty percent that are employed okay. on a temporary basis. So there is okay. that huge challenge which clearly is there in the industry okay and i was reading somewhere recently as well i mean these two don't match obviously that out of every 10 new recruits in the ev sector ev sector six are women and if one were to go by this this number then you know we are 
we should we should be celebrating but <laughs> i don't know how to do that is uh but uh, just to understand where are women in the ev sector like uh, are they on the shop floors or are they in the administrative position or are they in design or innovation or uh, do they get into stereotypical jobs or are they able to break the you know the ceiling glass ceiling and uh there is the chances of upward, upward mobility what are the skill set requirements or what are the kind of skill training that the automotive sector is providing them yeah no that's a very interesting question honestly i don't have any data but i can just give some perspective on how the industry value chain is focus right my assumption strongly is that a lot of these jobs are on shop floors from what we have read and what we are seeing on media about how companies are talking about many of them being engaged in the manufacturing sector which is basically assembling of these vehicles and getting them out right but the bigger question is also that have we really mapped what are the skill sets actually needed across the entire value chain from your battery um manufacturing battery pack manufacturing all the way to your vehicle and then you know coming out to operations i think it's a long value chain and we really need to the first step to me is really to get this done well is how do we actually map at both the national and the regional clusters so we have this clusters of automotive in say you know in western india is dominant then we have southern part of india and then northern this is where your whole automotive belt lies now the question is first is mapping i think that's extremely important and understanding what are the skill sets actually needed which you rightly pointed out right like some may be needed in policy making there will be some related to design vehicle manufacturing production processes and then after sales in terms of marketing in terms of insurance so there's multiple dimensions where we will need to understand where these jobs lie that's number 1 i think number 2 will then be to understand are our current um, institutes both at you know the bachelors and masters program from where recruitment is happening more in the formal sector and also iti's and in the informal what is the gap what is the skill set needed and what are the gaps once we are able to identify the gaps the third step would be the programs that we are talking about and there's a lot of focus actually even you know day before yesterday or last week i think the government of rajasthan talked about you know um a scheme for gig workers so and you know there is that definitely a component which can be tied to automotive sector so the question is there is funding available there are certain skill sets needed and there are certain gaps how are we actually able to bring this triangle into a linear point becomes the big challenge for us because there is let's not forget we are talking about you know where is the access to information available in this jobs to informal sector like how would people even know that these jobs exist first of all how would they even have access to go and you know get themselves enrolled in this training institutes and say that you know we want to actually get those skills we understand the challenges of formal sector you know people are educated you know you will have access to internet you will be able to get information even then there is information asymmetry no doubt about it so the question is once we do this mapping at a cluster level and identified what are the skills needed and then we actually do skill programs and it requires massive awareness and campaign and building that also it's not enough just to say okay there are this program there is this funding and you know we'll see increase at a society level we can't get into that discourse today we are talking about the intent itself to change and the mindset to change where we start there but when we get to the clusters i think these are the challenges and there are solutions can we use digitization digital uh, infrastructure as a tool to really help navigate this and i see a huge opportunity there we can definitely make this happen and we were also trying to map you know kind of looking at what are kind of jobs available the challenge is uh, you know we have ourselves been finding this challenge very difficult to hire people with ev understanding because you're also talking about not just very specific talent you're looking about multi sectorial discipline is also needed in some of the formal jobs today so you have very two different kind of problems that we are trying to navigate one is where you really need this multi sectoral uh, approach and when you're talking about more of informal workers where you really need very deep dive in whatever they are doing to ensure that 
they completely understand that so well. So how do we ensure that these two are actually taken into consideration and we are talking about doing a very well-designed program for this transition to include women? I think that's a big challenge we need to address. And if I may add two sub-questions to this because uh, this triggered uh, while you were speaking. One is obviously whether there is enough, I mean, in the automotive sector, we know that there is enough uh, industry academy um, collaboration. Also, you know, with the skill council, uh, skill development council and all. Is there enough in the EV sector right now or, or are they thinking in those terms? And secondly, uh, I mean, still with these skilling programs, which are run uh, through academic institutions or uh, the industry themselves, this will only be able to cater to the uh, workers who are there on the in the industry itself. But there is a lot of informal industry also attached to it. Uh, uh, you know, uh, repair shops. Uh, um, you know, on the go um, service providers. How how do we involve them as well? You know, because usually they come up like so generally they they are just there uh, to provide their services, but they never undergo. A formal training process or they are learning on the job uh, so how does one include them and you can you just repeat your first question you know you asked and it just really skipped my mind <laughs> <laughs> no, the first question was is there any uh academic institutions and industry collaboration in the no no that's sector? definitely happening i am sure you know the asdc and you know all the institutes they are collaborating and there is a focus and you know they are doing but uh, obviously there's much more to be done no but while you were talking i was actually just thinking of how to frame my thought you know i was saying that we need like transformative ideas and you know one of the interesting ideas that i saw in bogota was they have created this um, intersection of gender and mobility where they have really created this centers where people can come and learn at whatever age wherever they have left and they have Put these centers right at the access points of mass transit. Now, when we are talking about creating, um, I'll find the exact terminology. If Sonal remembers, uh, let me know. But I was actually blown away by that. So you are saying that even if it doesn't matter what my qualification is, but you are giving me the opportunity at a ward level to bring me to a point where there is free mobility access for me. And then you are creating that learning center so that I am actually equipped with whatever I want to do. Can we actually take a similar example and even pilot it and test it saying that in certain areas in geographies, we will provide free access to women and, you know, create these learning centers wherever they need to come and build those skill centers. So instead of asking them to say that, you know, come to X OEMs or, you know, Y's OEMs uh, learning abilities, we have a very strong ITI, you know, skilling centers. The issue is also about the mobility to access this. You know, there's a cost involved in it. We really need to really break those entry barriers to say that, you know, we will provide this skill set. You come here, we will take care. So the way they even created is they created this opportunity. If they were caretakers. So they actually said that the city will actually take care of the caretakers for those hours when these people are able to come. It's, you know, quite revolutionary in terms of what we are talking about. So if we are saying that we are truly wanting, you know, gender inclusive opportunities in the EV sector to be created, we really have to think of, you know, these kind of thinking that where is the problem for women to enter the workforce and then try to address this rather than saying that, you know, we'll just provide some skill centers, we'll give you some certification. That's fine. But unless we feel, um, you know, tighten and, you know, make it easy for the first mile and last mile access to these opportunities. I don't think we're going to really address these issues in true sense. So, Ryan, I mean, uh, what you also brought out very uh, interestingly is that it has to be age agnostic because we have seen that women do, you know, tend to take breaks in between employments for whatever reason, you know. Uh, so it's not that, you know, they. Uh, after graduation, they are into the job sector and they will remain there till the retirement, but they might, you know, take breaks and they, they want to re-enter the job market. And then sometimes uh, the provisions or, you know, the, their entry barriers to how they, or at what level they can enter. So I think such things should also be considered. But yes, Sonal, you wanted to bring in some data. 
yeah, yeah i was just thinking uh, you know i'll just build on a little bit on what uh, pawan has mentioned right uh, so when we started looking at data uh, and the first thing we did is we started looking at uh, data in stem courses right um, and we found that women now constitute 47 percent of incoming students right so i think this is a pretty important data point but it's not like this education is translating into equivalent opportunities for them so let me also give you uh, some data when we look at uh, when we looked at the um, uh, uh, plfs data as well i think this was for about uh, 1920 we found that the an unemployment rate was highest amongst women with diplomas, graduates, and women with postgraduate degrees, right? So roughly anywhere between 23 to 26%. The lowest unemployment rate is amongst uh, non-literate women. Now, what this means is that, you know, for, for a man and a woman who are both graduating from STEM courses, we are seeing such a high unemployment rate for educated women and i think this probably also brings this uh, issue front and center is what is it that is required and one of the things that power mentioned is really important first is you know sensitizing oem sometimes on one where can they recruit um, women candidates just kind of building this last mile but also creating gender inclusive workplaces because this somehow has to change in order to for women to become part of of the workforce as well i think and i think particularly in the in the ev sector too so i, I wanted to kind of just bring some of these uh, uh, data points as well because you know both men and women are both at probably the same same skill sets same skill gaps, then why are we seeing such a high unemployment rate, right, amongst women? So I think this needs to be really factored in. Yeah. Mahi, yeah. just one quick point. Sure, sure. This is exactly what I was uh, trying to reiterate, right? Unless we take and consider women's role as a caretaker in the society, which is so significant and important, because we forget that, you know, as a mother, as a sister, as, you know, a family, there's multiple roles that they're playing and bringing, and we don't account that, obviously, in our GDP calculations. The challenge is, if we don't bring that at center point of any discourse, it will be very difficult for us to really talk about any transition, because we forget that, what is that role? Because are we okay to let go of not having good future citizens in the country? And do can we really afford, you know, to say that, you know, there is no role for women to play there? If we don't bring that discord, then I think simply saying that, you know, oh, there is education, there's skills and there's jobs, that mismatch will always exist. So unless we address that, I think that is the root problem or a kind of a challenge, not a problem, that we need to acknowledge that role and say that what do we do now with this automotive industry that it is able to address this caretaking role and nature so that women are also able to participate and also ability to create then flexibility, much more options, you know, convenient times, locations. So there then multiple solutions will then emerge on how do we really ensure that this transition happens fair. Absolutely. And while you we are talking about, you know, uh which what we call collectively as decent work conditions. So whether, you know, there are uh, not just rightful opportunities, but also uh, uh, care or support or, uh, you know, a good and safe environment for women to be part of the sector. Uh, what is the view of the experts? Sorry. No, sorry. You know, and just, I was just saying, because, uh, you know, at least some of the technical jobs, right? Um, data analytics uh, or public transport operations, things that, uh, for example, may uh, can also be looked at, you know, hours that are more regulated, right? Those can become, so to speak, easier options as well, you know, uh, because we seem to have 
that um, that workforce, which needs to be trained a little bit in order to better take uh, better acknowledge um, how we can uh, look at you know battery telematics, public transport operations, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So those seem like places where this can certainly be made uh, possible as well. Sure. But I have two uh, thoughts here. One is that uh, you know, and if one is talking about decent work, and also I will link it to uh, labor rights or workers' rights. Uh, but um, what we usually see is that, you know, at least in the legacy uh, auto companies, there is a certain kind of work culture. And uh, with, you know, say, when wherever there is component manufacturing, so startups are coming in big way or, uh, and supposedly I'm employing more women now. Uh, there is a different work culture and probably they're providing, you know, uh, uh, these uh, uh, better provisions of how women can participate in, in the in the work. Are, are these like competing with each other? What do you think as in, uh, will the legacy sectors also try to shift their cultures in a way that they are more inclusive towards women? Or, uh, and also what do they think about, you know, uh, workers' rights per se, or, uh, you know, collectivization of workers, women workers, especially, I don't know whether there are any unions or any workers' organizations just for uh, women in the mobility sector. I mean, I know it's a, it's a distant dream right now, but <laughs> does the panel have any view on that? Manufacturing versus startup, I think that's a very interesting contrast. Um, let's also see what we are saying. Many of the startups are also becoming manufacturing uh, industries. So there are no more startups, right? So <laughs> they are now become manufacturing. But let's not forget that in manufacturing, it requires a lot of discipline, a lot of precision. We're also talking about, you know, assembling and, you know, components being put together. We are talking about ensuring that the products are really uh, safe and secure to be used, right? Versus in startup, it's a very different um, environment and culture because you're just working on an idea and you're talking about how do you really, it's more oriented in services, honestly. There was not a big focus on startups in manufacturing. Because of AV transition, I think it was a natural pivot. Many of the shared mobility providers actually have become manufacturers because of the EV transition. If you see, that's how the industry is progressing. So I would really say that I don't think we can, the culture wise, yes, we should to ensure that it is more inclusive and, you know, the manufacturing will have to really think that how do you attract uh, not only just talent, but retain the diversity aspects, but at the same time, not compromise what we're talking about, the quality and other aspects needed. Yeah, I think I'll just add on to power. what we're seeing, which is also quite interesting, is how... Um, we are seeing women only manufacturing plants, right? Uh, and we're seeing that with a number of, I mean, e uh, electric vehicle manufacturing plants. Uh, more so in southern India, um, you know, if uh, and probably western and southern India, and so, and also, for example, in uh, uh, in Delhi, I think they want to have uh, women only operated depots, and I think what either OEMs and decision makers or uh, STUs are doing is that I think they're trying to navigate this space, right? Because of this legacy culture, you know, um, of a male dominated transport workforce, instead of getting 5%, 10% women, what they're doing is trying to, at least in the initial stages, at least this is what I'm guessing, is setting up the entire unit as women only so that it also creates a safe work environment for them, right? I'm not saying this is right or wrong, it's, it's, it's an observation. Uh, and hopefully this becomes a starting point for more women to come, you know, in, in the sector, because it can be very uncomfortable if you have five amongst like, you know, a uh, hundred men. And so it can become extremely uncomfortable as well. So I, I think I'm finding this quite interesting. Uh, as you know, so just I as an observation. A, 
yeah. very brief point that only thing is it shouldn't really lead to kind of gentrification where we start associating that you know these kind of jobs which will be low paying get associated with women whereas you're in a very niche jobs then you know is uh, with men so i think that stereotype again we need to break so we need to be watchful about that absolutely absolutely uh, i mean we as in, at least the indian society does try to get into the uh, you know i mean the intentions are always right and uh, you begin with uh, with like affirmative action in some instances and then how it pans out later on that's debatable but i think as yes, for for starters some dedicated programs or you know dedicated approach or women's only approach is also is also welcome uh, but uh do you also see a difference in how uh women as, as job seekers in the sector and versus the women as entrepreneurs in the sector is there also uh differences uh, there uh, in terms of how they are able to access uh, uh you know uh, the market or the sector or how industry is uh, you know embracing them i think dominantly the trend would be more of job seekers compared to entrepreneurship because um the setting up a startup all that is quite challenging and it doesn't really favor you know there are programs honestly which do encourage that you know women only uh, founders and co-founders which is much more needed because i think it will really bring a whole different way of how we actually look at our systems if we are talking about changing systems then it really we need to do more of this that's what i would really say and there are women entrepreneurs who have shown the path but it's not enough so i would really say right now also the way our society is the income levels i think many of them are also trying to get into the industry and this industry right now is the sunrise so you see that you know a lot of them are getting to see as job seekers but i think we also need to create this culture where they are also saying that they will be job creators and that then really is a new dimension that can be brought uh, into the ecosystem i i i completely agree with pavan and i think the covid-19 pandemic had a big role to play in that right like the need for secure jobs in a very uncertain um ecosystem uh, you know is i think that if we want to encourage women entrepreneurs or forms with more women in leadership positions because we can also look at that you know, uh, where you have gender balance boards for example public procurement has a big role to play you know how what if public procurement criteria actually incentivize you know so you don't penalize but you incentivize or uh, give additional points in your scoring systems where there are more women in leadership or board positions because then what we can do is is actually have you know we don't need only women uh, uh run uh, businesses but more women in existing businesses as well so and in leadership positions i think public procurement has a very critical role um to play in uh, encouraging and elevating women in uh leadership leadership positions as well so very quickly do we have any example from the country right now or from any state uh where uh, women entrepreneurship is encouraged or like supported through incentives or things? big time in telangana the we hub you know the way they have really done i mean it includes obviously the ev sector and automotive sector and i think fantastic job like how and now they are creating this partnership i think with tamil nadu also i just saw it day before yesterday you know they it has really and it's not just limited to urban areas mandu i think that is a beautiful part it's really extended itself to really entrepreneurs from rural areas also into the belt providing that uh, financial assistance and incentive for them to able to kick start and test their models and we are not really even talking that you know we don't need all multiple millionaire entrepreneurs we are really talking about women who can really set up and you know create jobs within their community i think we also need to change the way we define that you know everyone need not be <laughs> saying that you know these are unicorns that we need to create on that mission it's about are we able to solve the problems that we are looking in our society of bringing more women creating jobs at the same time also ensuring that the earning levels are also increasing i think that parity issue also has to be addressed with this
So, Nil Manisha, would you like to add to that? Yeah, yeah I mean, I, I think as as a startup uh, in the transport sector, I I personally also um, have found the women's entrepreneurship platform quite helpful. Um, you know, that is created by Niti Aayog. Uh, they were at least, and, and especially during COVID, I found them very, very helpful in organizing so many sessions um, around different aspects of running a business. So this is not focused only on, on EVs, but, you know, uh, the things. So I have actually, and also how they are trying to both celebrate uh, women entrepreneurs, etc. So I have actually really appreciated um, the web uh, uh, as well. So, yeah, I think this is more a personal experience too. I think we'll need just this whole platform with all the opportunities and accelerator programs that exist at national level. You know, so many ministries run it. I've seen personally at MNRE, then, you know, the Invest India platform also has its own initiatives. So I think even bringing this information in one location and providing access, and of course, states are also doing so much. Sometimes it's also about do we even see what's actually happening in the ecosystem there's funds available it's just that where do we have information available for anyone on the street to be able to pick this up and you know be benefit from that sure i think i was thinking the same i was like yeah, we should have one portal where you know i can or anyone can access this entire list and say okay what is fitting to my purpose the best and then i can make the choice uh, but yes, that comprehensive portal is required. Um, uh, but thank you so much. I think, uh, I mean, and also in the interest of time, uh, brilliant discussion here right now. You've given us so much to think about. And also, I mean, we're all in the same boat, if I may say so, and trying to, you know, uh, be co-navigators in the, you know, in the entire socio-economic transformation space. So, uh, I have noted a lot of things here, um, starting from that, you know, gender inclusivity should also talk about trans people. And uh, it was a very well made point, as like I said, Manisha, and we will try to uh, explore that as well um, in in uh, next projects. Uh, but yes, data remains a critical gap um, and has to be looked into. Um, mapping of skill sets, like Pavan said, uh, which will, you know, then uh, basically help us understand, you know, what are the kind of institutions, uh, uh, incubation centers or you know, joint ventures or skill development uh, programs. Uh, the requirement will actually come when we map the skill sets. Uh, using digital infrastructure, I think very critical aspect. Since everything is moving to digital nowadays, uh, the digital platform should be uh, used optimally. Uh, in this respect, um, documenting best practices, I would also say, you know, something like the Bogota example, and probably there are many more in our country as well, which we need to look out for and uh, search, uh, put in one place so that, you know, we also get inspired and uh, not reinventing the wheel all the time. Um, multiple roles of women need to be uh, taken, to, taken into account when we are thinking about incentives and policies. Um, and uh, you know the entire discussion about how entrepreneurship uh, and at what levels of on the uh, enterprises can be supported, and that everyone doesn't need to become a unicorn. But yes, uh, we need to support community-led or women-led uh, entrepreneurs as well. And that again, in this space, there are platforms available which help uh, think tanks as well uh, in going forward. Uh, any last thoughts of uh, any like one change making idea uh, that you have right now <laughs> that or, or maybe something you know which is from your wish list and you think that you know if this is implemented then you know it can be a real game changer in the sector since you're asking man and forcing us to think i would say that uh, given fame three is being talked about can it really have that yeah. lens of gender given so much incentive will come out i think it will really create new opportunities and benefits in the ev sector because we're talking about two wheelers three wheelers four wheelers buses yeah. trucks and cars so i think definitely what i see that's pretty much possible and second is can states which are creating all these policies for gig workers really kind of 
relate that to uh, the automotive sector and the EV industry and you know create these opportunities for women. Yeah, I think for me, uh, it is also about, I hope that the EV policies at the state level begin to recognize that um, we may need uh, to be more gender sensitive in the way we think about asset ownership and how we make uh, specific and uh, how we collect the data or understand how women's needs might be different from men and incorporate them. I think that is my big one. Uh, for me, it will be that we should start collecting gender disaggregated data so that we can incorporate that in our all public transportation system or any mobility plans to begin with. Thank you so much. Thank you, Sonal. Thank you, Pavan. Thank you, Manisha, for your time. It has been a very interesting discussion. And as you might know, there are three more to come in this series. Uh, yeah, uh, with uh, other themes as well. Uh, and we hope to bring all of them together. And I think uh, uh, it was a great learning for me and I'm sure uh, everyone else, the audience will also learn a great deal from our discussion today. So thank you so much for your time. Thank you so much for having us. It's nice. It's always nice to discuss and talk together. Thank you, Mandi, for excellent moderation. And thank you, Cuts team, for inviting. Thank you.